In this video, we're going to take a look at how to approximate the area under the curve until we can get to the point where we're actually finding the area under a curve. If you'll recall, way back in section 1.1, when we first started our study of calculus, we said there were two main problems, and the first was the slope of a tangent line, and we have spent a lot of time on that all through chapters 1 through 3. Now we're moving on to that second big problem, which was the area under the curve. And in section 1.1, we said, hey, I can sort of estimate the area under a curve by drawing some rectangles and then just finding the area of each rectangle. But if you'll notice, if I do that the first time, I'm overestimating by quite a bit. Now, if I increase the number of rectangles, I'm still overestimating, but not by as much. And if I went on to eight rectangles instead, that would be even closer, or 100 rectangles or 1,000. So as you increase the number of rectangles, we increase the accuracy of our estimation. Another related strategy is to take the area using the left end point and the area using the right end point of the interval and knowing that our area is going to be somewhere between those two values. So obviously this is the overestimation. So this would be considered S of N because it's the bigger estimation um, because I'm estimating more. But if I use the right in this case, that would be little S of N because I'm underestimating by whatever I've colored in green. So we can see that the real area is going to be somewhere between those two values. So let's go ahead and approximate the area of the plane region using both the left-hand endpoints and the right-hand endpoints of each of our intervals. And as we're doing this example, I'm going to talk just a lot. And the reason I'm going to talk a lot about it is because this is sort of just an easy example of a process that we're going to repeat over and over for different questions. So I want you to understand all the parts of the process. So if we were making this real simple, we would just say, okay, well, this is obviously big S of N and we'll switch up colors over here. This is little S of N because obviously on the left, this is an overestimation on the right. It's an underestimation. So if I were just, you know, just trying to figure out the area, I would just find the area of this rectangle and this one and this one and this one. So if I were doing that, I would say, okay, let's, this first rectangle has a height of five and a width of one half. And the second rectangle has a height of 4.75 and a width of one half. And the third rectangle has a height of four and a width of one half. And the fourth rectangle has a height of 2.75 and a width of one half. So that's pretty straightforward, but let me make sure that we're making the proper connections here. When I found the height of five, that was the function value at zero. So this is F of zero and this was F of one half because it's, what is the function value at one half? It's 4.75, that's what I used for the height. And this is F of one, because at one, my function value is four, and that was, the, that was the height of the rectangle. And this is F of uh, three halves, or 1.5. Now again, to do the math here, yes, I would just take a one half out of everything, I would add, 5 plus 4.75 plus 4 plus 2.75. I would add those together and take it in half, and I get 8.25. Now, let's do the same thing for little s of n. Little s of n, if you'll notice, I'm using the endpoint on the right to, to determine the height. So little s of n is 4.75 times 1 half, plus four times one half, plus 2.75 times one half. And that last little guy is one. 
times 1 half. But again, making sure that we understand the connection here, 4.75 was f of 1 half. 4 was f of 1. 2.75 was f of 1.5. And 1 was f of 2. So again, the function value at 2 was 1, and that's where I found the height. So we can see what's happening is here I'm starting at 0, and I'm changing by delta x. And here I'm starting at not 0, but the very next one, which is delta x. And then I'm, again, adding delta x to get to the next value. Now, if I do all of that, again, I would take, whoops, little s of n, which is um, 1 half, and then 4.75 plus 4 plus 2.75 plus 1, and I would get 6.25. So what I know is that the true area is between 6.25 and 8.25. So somewhere between there lies the true area under the curve. All right, now we're going to math it up a little bit. We're going to generalize what we just did so that we can replicate that for other questions. So the first thing that we did is we determined delta x. So we're going to be looking at n subintervals. Now in our last question, we used n is equal to 4. But keep in mind that we are working towards using calculus, not just algebra. So in the future, we are going to use n subintervals and not four subintervals or some number. But in our last question, that's what we did. We used n is four, and we used an interval from zero to two, and that's how we came up with delta x, which is b minus a over n. So we had a delta x of one half, which was two minus zero over four. And that's where one half came from. So again, that is exactly what we did on the last one, even though we didn't really, you know, look at that. Number two, we use the left and right-handed endpoints. So again, we just worked through finding the area using the left-hand endpoints and the right hand. And if you'll recall, the left hand was f of zero, f of one half, all the way up to f of three halves, whereas the right-hand side started at f of 1 half all the way up to f of 2. So that's the difference here is for the left-hand endpoint, we're taking i minus 1. And for the right-hand endpoint, we're taking just i. Because if you'll recall, this is going to be a summation from 1 to n. In our case, that was 1 to 4. So when i is 1, we want just whatever that first value is of our interval. So in this case, we had zero was the beginning of our interval, and then we're basically taking one minus one or zero times delta x, and that's how we got f of zero. Again, working through that, you would take i is two, that would give you one times delta x, which is one half, that would give you the f of one half, and so forth. Now on the right-hand side, Again, we're just taking i, and i is just going to be then a of 0 plus 1 delta x. So that's how our first value was 1 half, and then 1, and 3 halves, and 2. And then um, we're going to use the height of each rectangle. I don't know why my ink keeps erasing. The height of each rectangle, which basically means plug it back into the function um, and multiply it by delta x, because delta x is going to be the width of each function. And then we're going to, and we did not, we did not do this part yet. So we didn't really do three or four yet, but we're going to basically find the area of each rectangle by finding the values of the function at each endpoint, multiply it by the width of each rectangle, which is delta x, and then we're going to use some calculus and use some summations. So let's take a look, and we're going to go through the first one very quickly. We're going to, or sorry, the first one very slowly, 
And we're going to start with the right hand side because it tends to be easier because we don't have um, an expression uh, like a binomial expression there. So let's take a look at the exact same question now using n sub intervals. All right, buckle up because this one's going to take us a while. Um, again, we are going to be using the right hand endpoint. We're going to use n rectangles and we're going to essentially put together what we've just done with making it a little more abstract so we can move into the calculus portion of this. So step one was to find delta x. Delta x, if you'll recall, is going to be the width of each rectangle. And we find that by b minus a over n. And in this case, that's 2 minus 0 over n. So we're not going to use 4. We're going to use n. And that just gives us 2 over n. So that is delta x, which is going to be the width of each rectangle. Step 2 is to find the right endpoint, which we're going to find that is going to help us to find the height of each rectangle because we're going to take f of the endpoint. So let's find the endpoint, the right endpoint. And remember, the right endpoint is a plus i delta x. So you might be asking, why am I starting on the right? Well, because it's going to be easier math. And not easy math, but easier than finding it on the left. So in this case, a is 0. I always stays I. I replace delta x with 2 over n. And then I simplify, and that turns into 2i over n. So this is my right endpoint, which I'm going to use with f of that endpoint. Step three, oops, I was going to change colors. Step three is that we want to find all of the areas of all of the rectangles. Now, it doesn't make sense for me to take 2 over n times 2 times 1 over n and then plus 2 over n times 2 times 2 over n, because that's how I would have to do it if I wasn't using a summation. So instead, we're going to use a summation, and we're going to say, let's take all of the rectangles from i is 1 to n, and we're going to take the height times the width. And remember, the height is f of the endpoint and the width is delta x. So that's what we're going to do. So what is the height? Again, summation as i goes from 1 to n. And you're going to be writing summation a lot, so just get used to writing it. The height is f of 2i over n, which we'll simplify in a moment. And the width is delta x, which is 2 over n. So again, summation as i goes from 1 to n. Now I'm going to do this part. This is the function value of 2i over n. So what's my function? In this case, negative x squared plus 5. So negative x is going to be replaced with 2i over n. So 2i over n squared plus 5. And then this is still 2 over n. Now from here, the good or bad news, depending, is that this is all just algebra. So just take your time with it so that you're not making any errors. Um, I'm going to go ahead and move to the next line here. So now I'm going to square. So this is still summation as i goes from 1 to n. And I'm just going to work on uh, squaring this. I'm sorry, this should be squared, not to the nth power. Um, so I've got negative. And then 2i squared is 4i squared. n squared is n squared um, plus 5 multiplied by 2 over n. Now I'm going to simplify further. So <clears throat> distribute the 2n. So 4i squared turns into 8i squared over n cubed and still negative, and then plus 10 over n. And from here, it kind of depends on what you're most comfortable with. For instance, I can take out a negative 8 over n cubed, 
and then say this is the summation as i goes from 1 to n of i squared and then plus and then it's up to you whether you take out the 10n i'm just going to leave it in there i equals 1 to n of 10 over n so i'm basically splitting it into two parts so for the first part i've got negative 8 over n cubed and then think about the summation formula for i squared what is the summation formula it's to take n times n plus 1 times 2n plus 1 over 6 so i'm replacing i squared with that expression and then plus well what happens when i have basically a constant so i really could have taken the 1 over n out if that makes you feel better so this is just 10 so when i take it times a constant i would have th this 1 over n on the outside but 10 would turn into 10 n so that's where we are so far now let's keep going let's simplify now all of this stuff on the top turns into 2n cubed plus 3n squared plus n so i'm going to rewrite i'm going to actually reduce this a little bit so i'm going to call this negative 4 over 3n cubed so i'm reducing these two values and then what i have left on the inside is the 2n cubed plus 3n squared plus n and then obviously this turns into 10 and then I'm just going to simplify further. I get negative 8 thirds minus 4n minus 4 over 3n squared plus 10. And then the only thing left to do is combine those two um, constants together. So my result is 22 thirds minus 4n uh, sorry, 4 over n minus 4 over 3n squared. So this expression represents the area using the right endpoint. Now, just for fun, let's just double check when n is 4, because we already determined when n is 4, we should get a right value of 6.25. So let's just double check. 22 over 3 minus 4 over n is going to be 4 minus 4 over 3 times 16 or 48 gives me 75 twelfths which turns into 6.25 so this is the appropriate expression now that was a lot of math doing this on the left is actually even more math a lot of a lot of ways that you can make an error so let's look at the left hand side but again, this is going to be our focus, is this expression that we just came up with. Now, to save you from having to do all of that work yourself, I went ahead and did the left-hand endpoint. And you can see that it does get more complicated because when I take um, i minus 1 and have to square it, then I end up squaring a binomial and I end up with a lot more going on in here. But I've done all of the work for you to come up with this expression, which you'll notice is almost identical to the expression we came up with before. Um, in the other expression, this was a minus. So here's what we have for the left-hand side. And again, I did a check and it did work out to the 8.25 we had before. So just to summarize what we have come up with, we have determined that the lower bound is this expression and the upper bound is this expression and when we turned it we plugged in 4 we got 6.25 to 8.25 now if i plug in 10 instead you can see those values are getting closer together or if i turn uh, plug in 100 instead you can see those values are getting even closer so now in our next video we are going to use calculus to let n approach infinity up next we're going to put together what we have just learned to find the exact area under the curve.